Hello, everybody, and welcome to Case Closed by John Swallow. Um, John Swallow, if you don't know, has worked in the private sector in the corporate general counsel of, the multi of a multinational company, as well as in the public sector as chief deputy attorney general and the attorney, attorney general of the state of Utah. So welcome on, John. How are you? Thanks. It's great to be with you this morning. Oh, this is great. So, so this topic that we're going to jump into now is about plea bargains. So I don't really know anything about what, what plea bargains are. Can you just cover that for us before we jump into more in-depth questions? Sure. That's a, that's a topic or a term, plea bargains, Yeah. That, are, uh, that is thrown around a lot. So it wouldn't surprise me if you don't have a lot of experience with that, having likely not been charged with a crime in your life. So, and many people out there haven't as well. A plea bargain is just a fancy way of saying a settlement. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason they use the word plea is because the person who's the accused is going to plea or plead guilty or non, no contest to a criminal charge. The bargain part is plea bargain is the compromise. It's a bargain. It's a settlement. It's a negotiation. So plea bargain put together means that there's been a negotiation and a settlement or a compromise about a, a, a criminal charge that is acceptable to the accused. Mm. And that's called a plea bargain. And it terminates the case, ends the case, instead of allowing the defendant who makes a choice to go all the way to a jury trial and let a jury decide what the result will be. That's, that's called a plea bargain. Okay. So let's, let's make it a little bit more concrete. Let's say I, I got mad at somebody and I keyed their car. At what point would I use a plea bargain in, you know, they're, they're suing me to fix their car, I'm assuming, at what point would we use a plea bargain or would we even use one in that case? Right. In that, that case, you likely wouldn't because keying a car in most instances is what is called a civil issue okay. where there might be a lawsuit. And so you'd, you'd be faced with, you know, a complaint in the civil court for damaging a car and have, and, and someone would hold you responsible for the damages to the car, which you could write a check out for. Mm -hmm. And that would be a civil matter in our civil justice system versus the criminal justice system. But let's say that you punched through a window of Ooh. a car and struck someone and you were charged with a crime of assault. Mm. And your attorney was representing you and talked about why, you know, you were, you were upset. You're, someone had just run over your pet Labrador. Oh. which is really sad. Yeah. And, and you were emotionally upset and you struck the window and didn't realize someone was inside and hit the person on the chin. And so maybe they would, they would talk about it and decide that maybe they didn't have the evidence or the circumstances mitigated the original charge. And they would simply reduce that charge to something beyond an aggressive assault. Maybe it would be an incidental contact type charge and, a lesser offense and you'd say, okay. And your lawyer would say, boy, that's a good resolution here. It wouldn't include any jail time. You'd pay a small fine. It wouldn't be as bad on your record. Will your, will your client take a lesser charge? And the defendant would say on recommendation of counsel, that's a good idea. I'd rather, I'd rather take the lesser charge than be prosecuted and go to a jury on the assault charge. And I'm happy to take that misdemeanor. I'm happy to pay that $600 fine and do some community service or whatever that deal consisted of. And then they would enter into that plea bargain, which would then be presented to the court. And then the judge would take a recommendation likely from the prosecutor and finish the deal, charge you a fine, have you do suspend the sentence and have you do some community service and it would be done. Interesting. So I see that as like a, a healthy balance between justice and mercy, right? Because, I mean, of course, the criminal justice system or, or in, in, a, in a court of law, that's the purpose is to enact justice. But, you know, if it was an accident, if it truly was an accident that I accidentally hit that guy, I got I got mad in this situation. Hypothetical, of course. Um, but right. <laughs> <laughs> but then like, I, I, am I a criminal? No, but I still need to have justice brought about right right and and and, and a resolution like that is mm -hmm. really in the hands of the prosecutor the prosecution team 
and judges listen carefully to the prosecutors, and sometimes judges do re reject the, the recommendations because in every plea arrangement, there has to be a basis for the plea, and so the defense attorney generally will lay out what the terms, what, what the factual basis for the plea is. The judge will listen to what the charge was, listen to what the resolution is, listen to any mitigating facts, and if it makes sense, and the judge feels right about it, then the judge can agree to accept the plea as, as offered. I've seen situations where the defendant felt like he hadn't done anything wrong mm -hmm. and wasn't willing to admit to the judge, even though the plea had been arranged, that he or she had done something wrong, and the judge wouldn't take the plea and, and advise the defendant to reconsider and say, come back in a couple of weeks after you really decide whether or not you can admit in open court that you did something wrong that forms the basis of the plea of guilty, right? And so there's just a spectrum here in the, in the justice system about how things work. And what is effective about plea deals is when they're done right. When there truly is evidence of a crime that's been committed, there truly are mitigation, mitigating factors there truly is an incentive for the state not to go all the way to a trial because it does take a lot of resources to all, all kinds of time and investigative work and judge time and jury time to get all the way to a jury trial. And so if justice can be served through an agreement that's fair, there is a purpose and a high principle for a plea bargain. They can also be abused. In some cases, a, 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 I would call it a rogue or, a, or a, an aggressive prosecutor will overcharge someone with multiple felonies or multiple charges, um, may not have a real factual basis for it. The defendant, the accused, and their lawyer may think, my goodness, the risk here is really high of being convicted of seven felonies. It's gonna cost a lot of money to get to a jury. There may have been a lot of publicity or something that would maybe create more of a risk for a jury trial. And so if they offer me a conviction on one felony instead of six, where the, that's the risk if I go to a trial, I may get advice from my lawyer that it's better for me in the long run to not take the risk of multiple felony convictions, take the one felony conviction, and that can be manipulated by, by prosecutors on, at, on occasion. And so it's really important for anybody who's charged with a crime to make sure they've got a good defense attorney who really believes in them, who really fight for them, and try to find that justice point in the whole case. And that's called a successful plea bargain. But if it's abused by a prosecution, then it can become a weapon, a tool to use to force someone who's not really guilty into a guilty plea. And that's happened. I mean, there's a, there's a famous case that's now a Hollywood movie about a guy named Brian Banks. He was a high school athlete with a lot of potential, was planning on going to USC, playing football there, a linebacker. He was just really a prized athlete and had a great future ahead of him. He was falsely accused of raping his girlfriend. Um, faced with the facts, faced with the circumstances that he had, he was convinced by his attorney to plead guilty of something he hadn't done. He pled guilty, um, was sentenced to like 10 years in prison, ended up serving six years, and then the victim came clean, admitted she hadn't been raped after all. And it turns out that this young man had spent six years in prison, hard prison, when he hadn't done anything wrong, but he pled guilty. So there are, there are occasions where, and, and it turns out that the, the prosecution wasn't fully transparent with the evidence or lack of evidence that they gave to the defense side, and it constituted a Brady violation. We'll talk about that at some point, but the, the famous case of Maryland versus Brady requires certain disclosures in the possession of prosecution to be given to the defense side. And if they're not, then it can be grounds to overturn a conviction. And so because those, those mistakes were made or those misuses were caused by the prosecution, it raised, raises serious uh, problems and challenges with the justice system and plea bargains in general. So plea bargains only really work the way they should if there's full transparency on both sides, if all the rules and laws are followed, if there's not co corruption in the prosecution process with overcharging or with bias, and then a defense attorney can have an honest discussion with their, his client based on the circumstances. The prosecution is willing to make concessions to avoid the expense and frankly, the unpredictability of going to all the way to a jury. 
and both parties resolve the situation in a way that seems fair to both sides. And that's an effective plea bargain. And that's, that we hope that that's what happens most times. Mm -hmm. that, that's the goal, right? Because justice at the end of the day, the justice system is about finding true justice or just justice, justice for everybody. That's a lot of justice right there. Um, <laughs> so, so just kind of backtracking to that um, case that you were just describing, what, I mean, how did justice come about there? He was in prison for six years. What happened after that for, for everybody that's kind of left hanging on that story? In this case, this young man, Ben Banks, did get a shot at the NFL, um, didn't ever get to go to college. Um, he, he lost six years of his life. Mm -hmm. Not only that, he lost six years of prime time for a young athlete, you know, from the time you're 16 until you're 24 or 25. Um, he certainly had his reputation ruined mm -hmm. wrongly by this young lady. Um, as far as the prosecution goes, there really wasn't a consequence to the prosecution. W with elected prosecutors, like the attorney general is an elected officer. I was an elected officer of the state. Um, you know, after four years or eight years, you're gone and you're doing something else. And so many times the people who abuse the criminal justice system as prosecutors or investigators, they're, they're gone or they have immunities that means they can't be personally prosecuted or, or even sued for what they've caused. Some states are making progress in creating resources, funds that, that innocently charged and convicted people can, can actually... Um, collect from, right? And in many cases, people who are wrongly incarcerated, they do have the right to go and sue the state or the government to get some kind of compensation for the years they spent away from their families. But how do you ever, ever replace the time away from your family, away from your friends, restoring the cost of restoring your reputation? You, you just can't do that. And so it truly is, a, is an injustice that many times cannot be 100% rectified. And that's why I think proactively as a government and as citizens, we should be very interested in making sure that we put in checks and balances to ensure that the system isn't abused wrongly, right? Used wrongly to hurt innocent people. And that's a responsibility that we have as, as citizens to, to stand up and, and speak up and fight to reform when we see things in our system that are broken that lead to injustice. Very well put, very so, well said. So Ben Banks, Ben Banks does not have the life he could have had, but for the lies of his former girlfriend and, and it looks like prosecutorial abuse. Mm. And it, it devastates, it, you know, I, I, let's, let's just say this. And this is, this, there's no, I can't give any basis for this except logic, okay? Let's say that the federal government or the state government, government gets it wrong. Let's say they get it wrong 10% of the time mm -hmm. on a plea basis. And that seems pretty generous to the government. If, if we have 2 million people in, in prison today across America and they get it wrong 10% of the time, only 10%, that's 200,000 people. Mm -hmm. Just do the math. Wow. How terrible would it be if there are 50,000 people today that are in prison away from their families, their friends, their jobs, their careers, their reputations, they miss Christmas, they miss Easter, they miss the summertime, they miss the ball game, right? And they're innocent people. How unthinkable is that? Hmm. That's what keeps me up awake, awake at night. Wow. The possibility of injustice. And so we really ought to continue to invest in checks and balances to make sure there's justice in America. Yeah. Well said, for sure. Um, just to make sure that we have a correct understanding of plea bargains, um, there's, there's three types here just that I'd like to get a little bit more of a definition on um, before we do finish up. But the three are charge bargaining, sentence bargaining, and fact bargaining. What are the difference between these three and what are they? Right, charges, facts, and sentencing. So in every one of those three categories, there is, there is a, a discussion about... You know, what can happen? So, so for charge bargaining, um, you may be charged. You, you initially, uh, the accused may be charged with six felonies, and and so concessions can be made by a prosecution about 
dropping some of the felonies in, in return for a plea of guilty to a few felonies, all right? That's called charge bargaining. And it can, can include reducing charges that are actually filed to lesser included offenses, which means something that's similar but less serious than the charge that was originally offered. That would be called charge bargaining, right? Um, fact bargaining would be um, in the federal, federal system, particularly for a plea, and in, it's that way in many states as well, you have to concede to facts what happened. And so there will be a description of the facts that are presented to the judge. In many cases, those are signed off by the accused. And so if you have a discrepancy in what the accused says happened, what the state believes happened, there can be a negotiation about that, and that would be called fact bargaining, right? The sentence bargaining certainly would be the consequence, the ultimate consequence of your guilty plea and the, the, the recommendation made by the prosecution to the court, to the judge, about how long you should serve in prison or jail. And that would be, you know, sentencing, negotiation or bargaining. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers your questions. The three right. components, uh, charging, facts, and sentencing mm -hmm. would be the, the bargaining that you do in a plea, a plea deal. And so you'd, you'd have like almost a different type of bargaining for each phase of that, correct? Right, and they can happen concurrently. It doesn't have to happen sequentially, right? Mm -hmm. But those are elements that are always very important to the accused and to the prosecution when you're trying to resolve a prosecution rather than go all the way to a jury. Interesting. There's significant leeway on on the prosecution side in, in many of that, of many of those circumstances. If Even if there are firm guidelines that they have to follow, you can usually get where you need to be by manipulating the charges, um, compromising on the fact statements, and then presenting something to the judge that the judge can then use following the sentencing guidelines of the charges that, that are pled to, right? Um, and the recommendation by any investigation and report given to the judge by a sentencing commission, for example, to reach what both sides feel is fair. And then the judge can throw it all out the window and, and sentence a person for less or for more, depending on a lot of variables. Yeah. It, is there ever a, a case where a judge may say no to the plea bargain and, and take it to court? Well, certainly the, the plea bargain has to be approved by the court. Yeah. So the judge can reject the mm. plea bargain. Um, the, the judge can't force the prosecutor to take things all the way to a jury because a prosecution, in most cases, can, um, can decide to dismiss a case. Mm. Okay, but we've, we've seen recently in the federal system where charges have been recommended to be dismissed on a very high political matter and which has been rejected by a federal judge. So it can, it can happen, but it's very rare. It's very rare that judges won't listen very carefully to, to a recommendation by a prosecution team. Good to know. And overall, now I actually know what plea bargains are. <laughs> I have a, a little bit more of an understanding. And so I don't know in what case this information will prove helpful, but thank you for enlightening us and enlightening our audience. And thanks for coming on, John. You're welcome. Plea bargains can be very help, helpful mm -hmm. as a tool, um, but they, they can be abused as well. So you have to kind of move carefully and cautiously through that whole process if you're a prosecutor or if you're a criminal defendant or, or a defense attorney. Good to know. Good to know. And, and thank you for joining. If you'd like to learn more information about plea bargains, law in general, um, click the link on our, in our bio or down below. Thank you.